Western Illinois University, and I am a victim of identity theft. And when I tell most people that I've um, been a victim, they're like, wow, you're, you, know, you teach accounting, you're a CPA, you're a CMA, you probably really worked hard to find this, right? I opened the mail. That's the, the extent of how I found out about my identity theft. It was in November, it was the week of fall break, you know, when we don't have to come to work and teach. And I, I opened the mail and I thought, well, wow, that's a credit card. I didn't apply for that credit card. It's kind of weird. I opened another piece of mail. It was um, notification that I'd been denied access to an account. And I opened the mail and I opened the mail and you can imagine um, how my heart started racing and I'm like, what's going on? Um, someone had gained access to my personal information and my husband's personal information. So someone had my address, my phone number, my social security number, as well as my husband's. And all of my identity theft occurred in the Chicago area. So state of Illinois was what you consider local. Um, and they went to all of the retail stores that offer instant credit. Um, if you've ever been to a store like Lowe's or Sam's Club, or a department store, or a jewelry store, or an electronics store. The people who stole my identity went to all those places. They went to each of those places and they tried to open an account. Um, I guess lucky for us, they were not successful with my husband's information. They had, his birth date was slightly wrong, so they knew he was Jason Ford, they knew where he lived, and, but they had one wrong digit in his birth date and they had one wrong digit in his social security number. So they were not able to open any accounts in his name. Um, they tried at several locations and eventually stopped trying with his name. Uh, with my name, however, they had all the right information. So picture someone with a fake ID that said Amy Ford and had all my information on it, their state of Illinois license, and they went to all these stores and got credit. Um, I didn't know I could go to six or seven stores in a two-day period and buy that much stuff. But you can, I guess, when it's not your money. And um, so again, I just found out about it from opening the mail. I had to call each company where an account was opened. And, and, and we started a fraud investigation. I had to sign affidavits. I also had to contact all the credit bureaus. We had to put a fraud alert on my social security number and my husband's. Okay? And I'm one of those people, as a typical accountant, and those of you who've had me in class, you can picture this. I am meticulous with my information. We don't have a lot of accounts everywhere. Um, you know, we basically have one credit card. That's, that's how we live, you know. And so you can imagine that when I got all this information, it was a lot to, to deal with. Um, I check my credit report every year. And checking my credit report, I would have found out about it eventually but I wouldn't have found it out about it as quickly, but lucky for me, my fraud people use my actual address. So what happens is they went and did all this the weekend um, of November 10th and 11th, and then I found all of it, I got all of it in the mail the week of Thanksgiving. And um, just over this spring break, I've gotten all of the accounts resolved. But in total, they were um, able to spend $15,000 in that two week period at all the different stores and um, I had to deal with all the different, each store or each credit card company um, I had to deal with and, and do different types of forms, but they were basically all fraud affidavits where I had to send um, copies of my correct ID, um, my signature. Um, they do have a picture of the person who stole my identity because when you open an account at Sam's Club, you become a member. I don't know if you've ever been to Sam's Club. And so they had a picture. So the Oak Brook Police Department, one Sunday night, I remember him, the, the detective calling me and saying, hey, we've got the picture. We got the picture from Sam's Club. So I'm going to email you this picture, and I want you to tell me if it's you, first of all. Did, you know, did, were they, did they have a look-alike? That's even weirder. Did they have somebody who was pretending to be me with my actual ID? Or um, do you know this person? First thought was, I hope it's not a student that I failed. <laughs> That would have been a little awkward, but I, you know, I would have known the person. Um, but it, they sent me the picture, and it's no one that I knew. My first reaction was, she looks way too old to be me. 
um, but looks nothing like me. So, um, so that at this point, I just contacted the detective actually um, last week to see if there was any more information. And right now, they just have a picture, and they're running it through the uh, state of Illinois database and uh, surrounding areas to see if they can identify this person. But for right now, we don't know who committed my um, identity theft. We do not know where they got our information. Um, but I have been able to correct my credit report and get all of my accounts closed and so that it won't hurt my personal credit uh, score and my personal credit. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Brett Baker. Um, much like uh, Amy over there, um, I got letters in the mail. <laughs> Just That's the only way that I found out about this. And uh, first I got a, well, they both came on the same day. I got an E-Trade a letter from E-Trade saying, oh, here's your online password, or login password, and then here's your, uh, here's your PIN number for your new checking account, your savings account. Well, I don't do business with either of these two firms, so uh, I immediately, uh, that, that, that just raised a red flag with me. So I, uh, I immediately called the fraud department. First I started with E-Trade, and uh, that, that took about an hour, hour and a half and uh, she needed a police report and all this stuff to open it up, but they flagged it as suspicious from the get-go because if the cash account was sitting dormant, it balanced to zero, nobody had transferred any money in there, and uh, so they, they, they just kind of, uh, they wouldn't allow anything in. Bank of America, I called their fraud department. This, this all happened on a Saturday too, so you can imagine how much, how much trouble I was going through. And the, apparently the person had opened up an account at like 9 a.m. and using my social security <coughs> number. They got a hold of my social security number, they got a hold of my, my home address, my name, but they, they screwed up my birth date. So they had it as like 1980 or something like that. Uh, I don't remember the specifics, but uh, they had opened up this bank account and then they had closed it. Uh, my guess is to just, you know, see if, the information would work. So I ended up on the phone with the a lady from the fraud department at Bank of America. And it turns out she was also a victim of identity theft. Um, so uh, I ended up having to go file a police report and the cop who took my report was also a victim of identity theft. You see a pattern here. Uh, <laughs> So, and then I had to file a complaint with the FTC, the uh, Federal Trade Commission on Identity Theft. Um, unlike Amy, the police have no idea who did it. Uh, they're, they're guessing that they probably packaged up uh, security numbers, personal information, all that stuff, and, and sold it as a bundle. Um, but I, I think I figured out what the, uh, what the scheme was. They would get a hold of somebody's bank account information, and then they get a hold of somebody's social security number, they would take the person's bank account, they'd take their balance or you know whatever they won't miss, or et cetera, and transfer that over into a cash account in somebody else's name that, that they opened up, and then they would launder that money and take it out. So they would leave me looking like, like I did it. So, uh, that was that was not a pleasant experience. I this happened last year. I have yet to hear anything about it. Um, I really don't care. Uh, I, I kind of like to get my hands on the person who did it, but uh, <laughs> but uh, other than that, I really don't. You know, I closed the. I got the accounts closed. I got. I I had to put a, an alert on my my credit report. Um, I had to pay for a monthly credit report. Uh, monitoring service with Equifax, and that goes with TransUnion, Experian, and all those other credit monitoring agencies. So, uh, it, all in all, it was not a pleasant experience, but uh, it, it, it could have been a lot worse, quite a bit worse. So, uh, just uh, my advice to anyone would be uh, be vigilant. But I, uh, like I said, I discovered this by accident. I. They had this sent to my home address, both, both of the things. Um, so I immediately went into, you know, trying to mitigate the damage or, uh, you know, trying to fix all the, all the crap that happened to me. So anyway, that's, 
that's, that's pretty much my story. Uh, I, uh, actually, my experience on ID tech is a little bit different than uh, the brand. Nobody opened up an account under my name. They actually made a copy of my credit card in New Jersey, and then uh, uh, I used to use my credit card in the USA last four years because I was an, an international student, so that was the cheapest way for me to bring money from home. And then I was very careful when it comes to use online so, uh, online websites to send money from my credit card to school, for example. I, ne I never used uh, web websites besides paying my tuition. But somehow, this fraudster uh, find my information, and then I was given a ride to one of my friends to the airport, and I happened to stop in the gas station and fill up my tank, and then my bank called me from home because I had an insurance, and they, they used to text me for every single transaction. And then they called me, they said, how come you can buy a gas in Illinois and in New Jersey at the same time? Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I'm in Illinois right now. And you are just making a mistake, probably someone else. Or they're like, no, it's just you and your credit card. And then they said, okay, one more transaction. We were just on the phone. They also had one more transaction with Bed and Body Works and it was too high amount. And they're like, I'm like, it's not me, just cancel my credit card. This was my first experience, so I came home and I was trying to uh, figure out what, I, what can I do <laughs> to solve this problem. I called Macomb police. They said, we don't have jurisdiction, we need to go to New Jersey or call that lo local police in New Jersey. I called them. They said, uh, you need to come and physically file that. And so I'm like, okay, I will spend more money to cover this fraud, it will just pay off. Then my bank called me again. I forgot, I was always, blaming that why am I paying this insurance every month, which was like five or ten dollars a month. And I figured out that actually covers my fraud or in case I die, because I was creating potential risk for my bank. That's why I was paying that insurance. So they covered all the fraud that happened to me. And then that's how I solved it actually. That happened last semester. I guess. Hi, I'm Corporal Anderson. I work for the University Police Department here. Um, Identity theft can, can derive from a whole, a whole series of different sources. I mean, mail theft, people will be searching for dumpsters. Um, people that have access to your personal information can then steal it and sell it. Um, it can be stolen out of a wallet. Somebody can lose their wallet. Does anybody keep their social security card in their wallet right now? One, two, three, a few people, okay. We get wallets that come into our department that are lost. They get turned into us. I look through it to find out whose it is, and I see a social security card, I see an ID, I see a credit card, I see the PIN number for the debit card and the behind their debit card in their wallet. All of these things make you extremely <laughs> risky for getting your identity stolen. Um, you, know, you, you don't lose your wallet on purpose, it just can happen. Um, obviously, the internet is another way that, that a lot of people gain access to that kind of personal information. Now, it can be used in a variety of different ways as well. Um, like Musa, he had his account taken over. People were just using his account information to make purchases. Um, you can also have uh, your personal information, like both Amy and Brad, where they were used to open up new accounts um, and then make all kinds of charges with those, including loans that people can take out and, and all kinds of different ways to get money. Um, another one which doesn't seem nearly as common, but it does happen, is, is they can use your information in the facilitation of committing a crime. So if they get caught doing that crime, they provide your information, and then when they get released for whatever reason, if they're bonding out or if they're um, just released on their own, the jail cell, the police officers, they have your information. So when they go looking for you because you don't come to your court hearing, they're actually looking for somebody else. So, and that can come back on you. Um, just to sort of highlight what was said earlier about the severity of the problem. There are about eight and a half million households in 2010 that experienced some form of identity theft. And credit card theft or use of somebody else's credit card account is the most common, that's about 65%. And in Illinois in 2005, there were 11,000 Illinois residents that experienced identity theft. 
and that puts Illinois at the time about 11th in the nation as far as uh, where they stand in the number of, of um, cases of identity theft. So because of that, Illinois set up uh, four specific laws related to identity theft. Um, there's facilitating identity theft, transmission of personal identifying information prohibited, identity theft itself, and aggravated identity theft. Um, the punishments or the severity of, of, of the crime dictates what happens. It can range anywhere from a class A misdemeanor, so if you're just providing access to other people's information, so you know somebody who is looking to get personal information and you just allow them into your into your area so you, they can get that information. That would that could be a class A misdemeanor, that could be a class four felony. Uh, it ranges, then identity stuff specifically has, it's broken down by monetary value. So if you are a victim and, and they take less than $300, that's gonna be a class four felony. If it gets over $100,000, that's a class X felony. So that'd be on par with you know major arson, kidnapping, aggravated, um, burglary, things of that nature. So I know Amy gave the example, they had over $15,000. Um, that's considered, that would be considered class one felony. So they could have um, as much as 15 years in jail for, or in prison for that. Um, but it depends on the, the value. It's the aggravating circumstances which make it a higher sentence or a more severe punishment would be if the person's an older adult, so 60 or older, or if they're in the active military, that it always bumps it up once, one step. So if Amy was in the active military and they stole $15,000 worth of items in, in her name, that would be a class X felony. And identity theft is investigated by a whole large group of different <coughs> organizations um, because it's, it's also a federal crime as well as a state crime. Um, it, it is commonly investigated on the federal level. Um, I know Brad mentioned the Federal Trade Commission. They kind of act as a, a clearinghouse, so they compile as much data and as much information, identity theft, as far as who the victims are, what accounts are, are taken over, and you know aliases that are used, addresses that are used, as much as they can so they can help facilitate the investigation. Uh, U.S. Attorney General's Office and State's Attorney General's Office all have, play a major role in investigation. Um, they're kind of advocates for anyone that's become a victim. The FBI has a specific cybercrime division, so they investigate all cybercrime. The major federal agency, though, that handles identity theft is the Secret Service. Um, primarily, they're the ones in charge of all identity theft fraud-related activities on the federal level. Um, Postal Inspection Office, Immigration, um, and of course a variety of, of law enforcement, local law enforcement, state law enforcement agencies. And I think some of the difficulties were highlighted by the people who have been victim up here. Um, part of it is there's no one agency responsible for all the investigation. I know Musa said he had to contact New Jersey and, and he contacted here and he was sort of running around a little bit as far as who to contact. That's part of the problem. There's not one place that does all of it. And so it, it can get complicated. They're also kind of like what Brad had said, where you have one identity, open one account, and then you use that identity to put money in another account, which was in his name. And so you have to find a way to link a fake name to a fake name to a fake name to a fake name. And so another problem that comes up is it doesn't get reported. So one of those names in between doesn't get reported to the police or any agency. So now you take that link out of the chain and you're trying to connect two links without a, a way to get them in between. And so that complicates the investigation quite a bit. Jurisdiction, like Musa said, it happened in New Jersey. So you get Macomb Police Department who doesn't have any access to anything that's going on in New Jersey. And so you're, you're getting that complication there. Not to mention if it comes from outside the country, Canada, you know, Russia, some a country in Africa that are involved in a lot of phishing schemes and a lot of ways to try to, you know, bait people to give them information. So um, it complicates things even more in those circumstances because they don't even have a, a contact within the United States to make. Um, and another issue that comes up is um, 
cooperations with financial institutions. They aren't going to give information to the police just because the police ask for information on your personal accounts. That puts it on the victim to actually go through the process of getting the bulk of the investigative material and then deliver that to police. Um, so if, if I call up a bank, if somebody comes and reports a crime to me of identity theft, and they say, this is my account, this is you know, the banking institution, I can't call them up and just say, get all the information from that account that I need. They aren't gonna give it to me because they're trying to protect your identity and your account. So you have to do all, a whole lot of the work yourself and bring me the leads to follow up on. Um, and, and that can't happen. Like in, in Amy's case, they got a picture. They got something there to go on. Really not a lot of information, um, but if they're opening accounts, they might have, uh, if they're purchasing things online or something and having items sent to a location, you get an address, you can go check that address. You can check Sam's Club and see if they've got video footage or if in this case they took a photo. And you can sort of develop some sort of lead based on that, but it, it kind of takes a um, slightly less sophisticated means of that crime being committed to have even anything to follow up on. Um, and so one thing that I'd like to clarify too is, is you know, individuals do have a whole so host of rights that the, the state has sort of granted them by public acts and, and different laws. Um, Musa said the city police said they wouldn't take his report because it happened in, in New Jersey. Illinois law requires that law enforcement agencies are required to accept an identity theft report and then provide a copy of that report to them if needed. Part of that is because when they go to the credit institutions or the credit facilities, they have to sometimes show that they have reported it as a crime or else they, they won't accept it as, as a fraudulent charge because they have to have some evidence that shows, yes, I didn't make this charge and I'm just not trying to get it removed from my account. So the police do have that requirement to take the report, provide you with a copy or at least a number, a case number for that report. And then if it does go into another jurisdiction, they may have to um, refer that to the other agency, but they still have to make that report. Um, in the situation where somebody uses your name and then commits a crime and then gets arrested under your name, um, the courts have what's called a factual declaration of innocence, where you basically go to the court and you petition them to say, I didn't do these crimes, and they will give you an actual legal clearing of, of sort of the fact that you did not do that crime. So you're declared innocent of those crimes. And then of course with, um, you can put a security freeze on your account so nobody can open up any more um, accounts because they'll have to do a credit check, the credit check will pop up, the security freeze, they won't be able to, to create a new account. And in Illinois, if they're a security breach, so if, if a company does have their information tampered with or, or accessed by someone outside, they're required to tell you that your, access, your account may have been compromised. Um, and as far as some personal examples of, of identity theft cases that I've dealt with, um, Again, they highlight a lot of the problems there are in the investigation itself. Um, recently, there was a, a situation where a, a debt collector was contacting someone here at the university. They were contacting them repeatedly to try to get in contact with them because they owed money on a loan that they had taken out. Well, this person had been victim of identity theft. Someone created this account without their knowledge, and it was actually in Canada. So. Our jurisdictional problems were really highlighted there because this happened outside of the country even. Um, I called that the, debt, the collection agency and talked to them. Again, they wouldn't give me any information. They couldn't show who I was. They didn't, uh, you know, I, I didn't have direct access to that account. So they had to go back on the victim. They had to be the ones to contact them and, and determine all of that. Another instance would be um, Sherman Hall, the billing office contacted me. They had received notification from a credit card company that there was someone who had said that the charge made to their card was a fraudulent charge and that payment was made to WIU. Um, now this person was in Texas that owned the credit card. So I wasn't even getting the report from the person who was the victim. You know, university wasn't out any money, they weren't out anything because they just put the, the bill back on the student's account. The, the credit card company wasn't out any money because Western just refunded them. So you've got a situation where nobody's out any money. The victim is in Texas and hasn't contacted the police. 
I still looked into it to find out whose account it was and, and try to figure out what happened. But again, then that was somebody that made the payment was in Chicago. So again, it gets really difficult to investigate and, and lock down exactly who used it and what happened. The more common, more solvable ones were, an example would be, we had a, a roommate who had her credit card used fraudulently while here at Western. Um, pizza charges, so somebody had been ordering pizza with a credit card. She suspected her roommate. Roommate would have access to a credit card number. Um, so then we went through the process of contacting the pizza delivery company, finding out when it was, where it was at, you know, what name they signed, and it, if possible, we got we ended up getting a, a, a hold of the delivery driver who had some description of who it was and the circumstances around it. We go back and we look at the video of them coming back into the residence halls. We see, yes, okay, this is the person. Hey, that looks like her roommate. We talk to her, you know, she ends up admitting to the fact that. Yeah, I used the credit card. I, I took it. I wrote down the number. Wrote down the, the, all the numbers that I needed to, and made that purchase for pizza. Okay. Now, those are all cases where we have had dealt with. And that's identity theft. Those are all identity theft cases. Now, the, the most, the last one was the credit card use for the pizza purchases. That was actually handled as a theft case instead of an identity theft case because of the charges and the way that the state's attorney prosecuted that. And so that's another part where you get into some conflicting areas because just because it's identity theft doesn't always get investigated as identity theft or prosecuted as identity theft. So it's, it's, it really is very complicated and it's really frustrating because it doesn't seem like police are doing anything or doing enough, but it, a lot of it we can't do. And a lot of it we're limited on because of geography and access to certain information. So um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't report it. doesn't mean that, I mean, you should just sort of drop it because that kind of contributes to the problem. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue and it's one that we definitely deal with here on campus and all the departments around the nation do. So it is good to have this kind of talk and be aware of the problem. Good morning. I am Sheila Henderson from Mid-America, and I'm going to give you a brief overview of our program that we have. Um, I can't speak for other institutions, but um, first of all, what has happened is uh, our program has been in place since October 2008. We are heavy regulated, so again, the regulators say, hey, this is something you've got to put in place, but as you've heard, it's constantly growing, and it's a serious issue, identity theft. Um, on our program, we had to put it together, board has to approve it, and we have to have it submitted annually. You know, maybe if there's changes or things we've added that um, the regulators want us to add or delete. We have to do uh, annual training for the employees. Um, I oversee this program, so I do the training, and we have uh, about an hour we do. Uh, right now we're targeted every March, they do an hour training. Um, we go through the policy and the program. And then they're basically, they have to go through it again on their own and sign off on it. So again, that's something we have to do annually. And now I'll just give you some of the highlights of our program. Uh, Brad had mentioned when he got his mail, that was a red flag to him. Well, actually in the program, we have listed 25 red flags that we have to present to the employees that comes with the, uh, the program itself. Um, some of the red flags would be suspicious documents when you uh, are waiting on somebody or you open a new account for them. You may have a driver's license that really looks like it's been doctored up or altered. That would be a red flag. Um, and an address when you're opening an account. Um, I'm not very familiar with Macomb, but I think like say if you were opening an account and they said they lived on East Jackson, way out there, that what you call the nine mile on the north side, that's a field, right? Well, that would be a red flag. Or if, uh, like in Canton, we have a prison. <laughs> or an airport, if they gave that as their address, that would be a red flag to us. Again, we know our markets, and we know the housing and that type of thing, because it's small. You know, we have branches in Cuba and Lewiston as well. So we would be familiar with our uh, addresses and that type of thing on the residential. Another one would be uh, Social Security that they talked about that they had acquired and used. Um, what we do in the back room, again, most people don't know this, like when you open your account today, tomorrow we do a scan on your social, just again, it's for items that we have housed. And if we have a hit where there's two people with a social, it produces a report. Yes, this happens, but it's always been explained. 
like uh, today I'm Sheila Henderson and tomorrow I'm Sheila Yerbeck. Well, someone's got married, obviously, right? And again, we have to make sure that's true what happened. Um, you may have where years ago you opened your account as Becky Smith. Well, now when you open an account, we actually want your driver's license, but your driver's license may say Rebecca Smith. Again, every time that's happened to us, again, it's always been something we've cleared up. Um, also under our program, we have what we call CIP. That's the Customer Identification Program. We have a system we use where we have to certify your identity. What does that mean? Whatever you give me is ID, um, again, we have to have a program to prove to what we're going to accept. We'll take a driver's license, passport, and that type of thing, and we do have to have special uh, procedures for elderly. So we take your information you give us and we certify your identity. What that does is uh, tells me what ID I've had, and I have to maintain it for five years on the system. I will put in your social. It tells me your social was issued a certain year and it's valid. Okay, and it stops there. The next step we do is the credit report we talked about, all right, and I think Amy mentioned where she does hers annually. The credit report to us has twofold. It will tell me Sheila Henderson equals this number, okay? If it's not, I'll get an alert, so we might have an issue, right? Also on the credit report, it tells me your address that you've provided me. If I say I lived on Chestnut, but the credit report says I live on Maine, I have an address discrepancy. So under the program, I as a customer, I have to prove to you that that's my address. I don't know how many of you have opened an account from Mid-America, but obviously if you live somewhere else and now you're in Macomb, what we did is again have procedures in place. We used your ID. So if we have an address discrepancy, we used your ID because you probably gave us your home, wherever your home is. Me as an individual, I possibly would give you a copy of my phone bill with my address or maybe a magazine subscription with my address, that type of thing. Real estate taxes, again, the customer has to prove to me that's what their address is because the credit report has a discrepancy, all right? Um, some things that we did put in place, the deterrence, we had a lot of new forms we issued or started up on the implementation of the program. Today, if I open an account for you and you do your checking and savings or whatever, and then you get a check card, that's great because it's all in one process. But if I open an account for you, say, three months ago, and you came in to me today, or maybe a teller or a personal banker, and you say, hey, now I want a check card. I fill out the form, and great, I used to write, no customer, we can't do that anymore. I cannot complete the transaction unless I get your ID. That's even to order your card. Okay, so now you come in a year later and your card's cracked or whatever, you want to reorder a card. I gotta have ID, fix your ID. All right. Um, if you are going to change your address under the program, of course you're going to complete a form, old address, new address, and then we put it in our system, our data processing system. So what it will do tomorrow automatically is going to send a notice out, old address and new. So we're hoping, you know, hey, if you get this and say, I didn't change my address, again, that's a process that you, goes back in your hands, you've got to notify us, you did not move, that type of thing. Um, I think Brad mentioned the accounts that were open online. We are doing that. Um, again, I'm not going to see you, right? Because you're going to be doing it at the computer. There's information you're going to complete. And then there's going to be a series of questions called out of wallet. Those are questions only you would know. They may be, again, if you're older, they may be, hey, of these four answers, what's the closest to your house payment? Or what county was you born in? These are personal information that only you would know, not necessarily everybody else. You have to pass so many, and if you don't get a percentage, so like 75% or more, Frank Jackson quits, all right? So that's on online opening. If you do pass, we still follow up with the credit check and certify your identity. We still have the option to not open that account because there's process that we will do, you know, behind scenes the next day, operational, okay? Um, our data processor houses all of our customers' personal information. You know, that's your name, address, your birth date, your social, your account numbers, you know, your type of accounts. Again, we have to have confidentiality agreements with them. All right, every vendor we use uh, to order your checks, to order your check cards, confidentiality agreements. To do the credit check, we use TransUnion. We have to have a confidentiality agreement. So again, they will not share your information. 
Um, the last thing I have is, uh, this isn't in our program, but I think it was, I don't know if I'm saying our name right, Musa was talking about the card that was reproduced. Again, that does happen. I don't know how we get away from that because they sometimes tell us, again, I, this happens to me too. When you go to a restaurant, you know, like not, not McDonald's, but if you go to a nice restaurant and they take, bring your uh, bill and you give them your card, they say you should never let your card leave your hands. But we all do that. I do that. And we had a situation where, again, someone was in Mexico, they took their card back, and they had a reproduction. Again, there's fraud right there. And the individual had up to $9,000 on their account. Not all of us would have a balance like that, but they did. Again, that type of thing happens all the time. How do you do that? Do you follow them to the kitchen so they, you know, but that's not possible. I mean, I, it happens to me every day when you go somewhere, someone, you know, you give your card out to a restaurant, you give your card out even over, you know, the online when you purchase that type of item, so. Um, we as an institution, and I'm sure credit cards too, would never ask personal information over the phone. Uh, we had a situation a while back where um, our customers got text, and I, I think 18, 24 months ago, and they were asking their account numbers. We would never do that. We would never ask your account number. We would never ask your social, and I'm sure your credit card company but not either, so do not give that type of information out. If they're doing some kind of identification, they might ask your uh, address, last four digits of your social, that type of thing, but we would never ask for your account number, and we would never ask for your social security number. Okay, thank you.